So, ladies and gentlemen, let me, um, let me welcome you to the United States Institute of Peace. My name is Bill Taylor. I'm the Executive Vice President uh, here, and I'm very pleased uh, that you've joined us here on this uh, July afternoon. This is a tribute to the panel, as I've already indicated to them, that, uh, uh, that to bring this kind of a group together um, on, on these kinds of issues, I think, is, is a real tribute to the importance of those issues. Um, arts and culture have been a part of the work that the Institute of Peace has been doing. The Institute of Peace, you will be interested to know, is 30 years old this year. Um, 30 years old. Now, you probably didn't know this, but uh, probably only you've heard of it in the last couple of years when you see people here and uh, others of the, of the USIP team that you're more familiar with. But we've been around for 30 years. Now, we haven't been in this building for 30 years. We were in other parts of the city. Some of you may have joined us or visited us or participated in some events at these other buildings. Um, they weren't quite as nice as this building. This is a, this is a, we're very pleased to be here and, and to celebrate the 30th anniversary uh, in, in this building. And we're very pleased that you could be here as well. So art and culture has been a part of our discussion for 30 years. Um, and we, you have seen some of the art out here and you will hear about it and the artists are are displayed in front of you here. You'll hear from them here shortly. Um, uh, but even before that, uh, you will have an opportunity to hear from one of our, one of the USIP stars. Um, and it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to have Maria Stefan with us. And Maria um, it chairs and is the driver uh, behind our Arts and Culture Forum here at the Institute. But she's also known, maybe even better known, as the civil resistance expert here at the Institute. And you may hear a little bit about, uh, about that from her. So without anything further, let me again welcome you here. Very glad to have you here. And Maria, uh, over to you to introduce the panel. Uh, thanks very much, Bill, for that introduction. And uh, let me join Bill in welcoming everyone to the Institute this afternoon. It's a terrific turnout. Um, definitely a tribute to our panelists today and to this awesome topic of arts, culture, and peace building. Um, so I want to welcome you to this uh, panel event and exhibition celebrating the role of visual arts in both transforming conflict and in building peace. Uh, USIP approaches peace building from a, a variety of lenses in, a, in lots of different ways, both here in Washington and out in the field, uh, where we run a variety of different uh, programs and activities. The arts uh, represent one uh, highly creative tool that peace building practitioners can use to bolster uh, the reach and the effectiveness of their work. And these include, of course, the visual arts, literary arts, performance arts, and movement arts. USIP, through its grants work and the Arts and Culture Forum, which is a cross-institute uh, initiative here at USIP, is increasingly using these methods to achieve our goal of preventing, mitigating, and reducing violent conflict around the world. As Michael Shank and Lisa Schurch um, have written in their pivotal article, Strategic Art Space Peace Building, Art is a tool that can communicate and transform the way people think and act. Arts can change the dynamics in intractable, interpersonal, intercommunal, national, and global conflicts. John Paul Lederach, another peace building stalwart, writes in The Moral Imagination, The Art and Soul of Building Peace, this quality of providing for and expecting the unexpected is well known in the world of artists and needs to be cultivated in the world of peace builders. Creativity opens us to new avenues of inquiry and provides us with new ways to think about social change. Although solid theory research and evaluation of arts-based peace building are still being developed, I have certainly seen its impact out in the field. In Syria, a country and a people that are very close to my heart, some of the most amazing activists have been artists from all different sects and religions in parts of the country. Their work, animated puppet shows, vibrant graffiti, musical lyrics, dance, spoke of universal themes of freedom and dignity and inspired the nonviolent resistance that motored the revolution in its early phase. 
Today, against all odds, Syrian poets, painters, musicians are using art to connect the four million refugees outside to their badly wounded homeland and to the rest of the world and to promote a sense of unity and solidarity. When used in conscious, strategic, and coordinated ways, the arts can measurably contribute to peace building and amplify its reach and impact. Today's conversation, moderated by Ambassador Cynthia Schneider, will speak to how visual arts have been creatively and effectively incorporated in peace building activities around the world. So to start with introductions, Ambassador Cynthia Schneider is a distinguished professor in the practice of diplomacy at Georgetown University, where she teaches, publishes, and organizes initiatives in the field of cultural diplomacy, with a focus on Western relations with the Muslim world. She also led the Brookings Center for the Middle East Art and Culture Dialogue and co-directs the Timbuktu Renaissance, which you saw a film clip of, both of which seek le uh, to leverage art in order to counter extremism and promote peace and development. Leon Shahabian is the president and executive producer of Leolina Productions Incorporated. He produces award-winning documentaries and compelling reality TV series that are consistently broadcast in prime time on leading American and pan-Arab cable and satellite networks. Mr. Shahabian is a frequent guest lecturer at leading universities and think tanks. Khalid Rausch is the director of USIP's Rule of Law Center. She has a focus on criminal justice and police reform initiatives and has completed missions across Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Northern Africa, and Central and Eastern Europe. Manuel Leon is the visual communications designer with USIP's global campus and is devoted to enhancing communication through different media, such as painting, advertising, film, documentaries, and interactive design. He also uses his work to preserve and share his Mayan heritage. So we have a terrific lineup for you all today. It's wonderful uh, to have this event as part of USIP's 30th anniversary. And so on behalf of the Arts and Culture Forum here at USIP, I turn the floor over to Cynthia Schneider to lead us uh, through the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. It's an honor to be here and an honor to follow you. And I recommend to anyone who wasn't there to watch online the fantastic panel discussion this morning that Maria moderated on civic resistance and peace building, featuring, among others, USIP's president, Nancy Limburg. And one of the subjects that came up in that discussion weaves together. Please, those of you at the back, come sit up at the front. There's plenty of room, so feel, feel free to come sit. Um, weaves together those themes of peace building, civic resistance, and arts and culture. And that was the discussion of the film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which chronicles the story, the heroic story, of the civil resistance in Liberia, led by women, including Lema Gabawi, the eventual Nobel Prize winner. Uh, but and, and she, of course, always deserved the Nobel Peace Prize, but I think she got it because Abigail Disney and Ginny Redeker made a, this film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, and then took it everywhere and used it everywhere to demonstrate the power of civic actors in peace building. Um, and that spread the word uh, about their work, and Maria was just telling me that she has seen that film never in English, many times in Arabic, because it was shown so many times to Syrian activists and how much it spoke to them. So that example raises several key issues, I think, that help frame our discussion today. And that is the universality of arts and culture. You know, we always talk about a picture is worth a thousand words, M music is the global language, and I think behind all of that is the power of storytelling. And what gets behind that is the power of emotion. And this is a kind of word we don't talk about a lot in Washington, right? Because we're very serious and do policy. But um, here is the dirty little secret. It is actually emotion that directs our decision making. Uh, this is a neurological fact. This is not my crazy idea. 
Uh, so there is a reason that these tools are so powerful. It is stories that engage us in an empathetic way uh, that cause us to change our preconceived ideas and give us the strength to move forward in a different direction. So that's a kind of general overview. Let me give you just some thoughts that relate more specifically to this intersection with policy. Um, first of all, I'm, I like to quote something that the Nigerian uh, novelist playwright Wally Soyinka said, art humanizes, politics demonizes. And just think about that. Think of how much time we spend, particularly here, but in many places, dividing, 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 and putting one against the other. And art, on the contrast, allows us to humanize these uh, political conflicts, which, guess what, are caused by human beings. So that does make a certain amount of sense. Um, another idea is the idea, and you'll hear about this, of leveraging local voices. Traditionally, and very effectively in the Cold War period, the United States used arts and culture by sending American artists, writers, musicians, jazz musicians most famously abroad. And that worked very effectively. But I would suggest to you that in today's era of social media and 24-7 communication, what is much more effective and has a stronger impact is to leverage the local voices, give them a platform, help them reach their audiences, because that's what will resonate. And you'll hear many examples of that. And then finally, I'll just leave you with one thought. Um, I spend my life uh, promoting, trying to get people to think about the power of culture in diplomacy and international affairs. Uh, that is often, not always, I have a wonderful home at the Brookings Institution, but that is often met with blank stares. It's like, no, no, we're doing serious things here. We don't have time for culture. I would just get you, ask you to think about who does recognize the power of culture. And that is the violent extremists all around the world and throughout history, whether they are related to Islam or not. The Khmer Rouge did this also. But what do they do? They target culture. They target cultural heritage, and they target living culture. And I would suggest to you that's because culture is the root of identity. And if you want to control people, you have to undercut their roots and their identity. So if they can recognize the power of culture, you know, maybe we should also. So let me now turn to uh, our very distinguished and very diverse panel, beginning with Colette Rausch. Colette, I'm not going to reintroduce you. I'm going to ask you to go ahead with one of your many projects, and then I may follow up with questions on another. And let me just tell you, I've, I've submitted these um, poor panelists to a rigorous regime of five minutes apiece, uh, and then we're going to be sure to allow questions from you. I'm going to be very mindful of that, so I'm going to keep it within my five minutes, and I'm going to talk about three intertwined uh, themes, and it is storytelling, shrapnel, and sculpture, <laughs> and they all fit together. Um, we talked a little bit about storytelling and the critical nature of it, and there's a project that we worked at at the USI, US Institute of Peace for about seven years, and it was a Speaking Their Peace book project. And it was an, an endeavor to try to get beyond, as Cynthia mentioned, the politics, the technical nature, the policy, the think tank, the things that we do really well in Washington, and go beneath that to the human, this human story, narratives, personal narratives of individuals. Um, and in the, in the long tradition of storytelling, we wanted to bring stories of people from different conflict zones. So over the years, we went to 11 different conflict zones where we were already working, and in the evenings and mornings, reached out to people, whether they're taxi drivers, mothers, insurgents, ministers, and in our spare time, interviewed them and asked them basic questions. What happened during the conflict? What motivated you? What do you want for your future? And then took those stories and compiled them in a book and took photographs in the process to convey the, um, their personalities and the scene in which they were being interviewed and the power of that and to let them speak in their own way about what was going on and that they had their own wisdom. 
It was through that process that I was in Libya and Benghazi. It was a few months after the Gaddafi regime fell and after he had been killed. And we were in Benghazi with a workshop on how to deal with past abuses through what was called the transitional justice system. And we went to a museum. It was this beautiful old Italian um, era villa in Benghazi that overlooked the water. And we walked inside, and there were photographs all over of many of the people who had been killed. It was a martyr's museum. And they were stood up. I know we have a member from the cultural office at the, at the embassy in Libya. And they set up in Zawiya, Misrata, Benghazi, Tripoli. They had martyr museums to honor the, the, those who had been killed. But also, I came across a welder. And he was welding together pieces of material. And we wanted to interview him. And instead, he asked us that we interview a young Libyan woman who was an artist to tell his story and the story of the museum and what, what this metal was that he was putting together. So what I wanted to do, and that's where the shrapnel comes in, I wanted to do is just read a little bit from her story. And this welder, his name was Ali, and we learned that during the revolution he had been making weapons um, out of everything that they homemade weapons that they could put together with weapon mat material and metal and then at the same time because he was an artist at heart and under the regime he was not able to really use his art but now he could he was welding for for a different future a welding art and things like that and this is part of Ollie's it's Don Quixote and Donkey this mm. is part of Ollie's art that mm. he he welded and those who are weapon aficionados, this is part of um, a 50 caliber, which was a very common um, wep piece of weapon that you could roll out you know, on the back of a truck. Um, so that was part of it. So there's different pieces of weapon, different parts of tanks that he took together. And it was just this explosion of items all through that he had done. When you walked into it, you're overwhelmed with, with sculptures of dancing cows and, and all sorts of ballerinas and everything. So I just want, in closing, to read from Salwa's story, where she had come from Libya, from France, during the revolution to try to help in whatever way she could. She said, when she was talking about what was going on in the museum, she said, everything was made from burned weapons. Ollie transformed them into candlesticks, musicians, an orchestra, a woman and her baby, fishermen, a bicycle. And now that Gaddafi is dead, Ollie's work is more joyful. He started to do dancers, tango dancers. Everything is dancing. This used to be a missile. Now it's a shark. It's very symbolic. He never cleans the material. It's burned, it's cut, it's broken. It's a very important message for the wounded, the people who lost family members, the people who got depressed because they were very young and they lost a leg. He wanted to give them the message that even if you are broken, your life is not over. I met the families of the martyrs. I had a grandfather crying, saying he has lost 12 of his sons. I felt so tired, so exhausted. Then I came here to this exhibition and met Ollie, and I saw weapons and tanks. I was so tired of it, so I asked if I could paint one of the military cars. They said yes, so I painted it pink, and she started to laugh. Then I painted flowers on it. What I did with the revol during the revolution was paint a car that was a war car pink. I didn't realize it, but painting truly helped me a lot. It was my therapy. This place is my therapy. When I painted the car, I saw the smiles of the children and the people and felt the positive energy from the people. So in honor of Salwa, when we went to the museum, there was the pink car with flowers sitting out there. So I'm wearing pink <laughs> for Salwa. And it's just, again, going back to the what art can do as far as conveying emotion, how it can help people transform their own trauma, how it can be a symbol of resistance as Ollie had done, and how there's just many different stories through art that we wouldn't think about, but the power of the objects. Thank you so much, um, Colette. I'm going to follow up with a, a question about <laughs> another subject. I just want to, if you don't mind, Huayda, I just want to draw attention to the um, cultural attache who's here from the Libyan embassy. Uh, she's, of course, trained for her job as a cultural attache through her profession, that is, as a dentist. And I say that just to point out, it's so easy to forget. What do you hear about Libya 
oh, well, you know, what a mess. Everybody's fighting. Is there a government? Everybody's fighting. No, there are still people such as Hueda and her boss, who is a cousin of the famous um, activist uh, Salva Bougaisis, who was murdered about a month ago, uh, Wafa Bougaisis, your ambassador, uh, who have given up their lives and are doing everything they can, whatever it is that they're called on to do, to try to pull their country together. And it is their stories and the stories that you uh, bring out that we need to focus on. That is the, you know, that's the hope of this country. But there are many different things you can talk about, Colette, and I want to give the audience just a little bit of a sense of what else they might be able to ask you about. So I wondered if you could just give a brief uh, sketch of two other things that you spoke to me about, and, and if you'd rather bring in something else, that's, that's fine too. Number one, in Yemen, and we have two people who've worked in Yemen here on this panel, so we can talk about that with Leon also, the art tent in Change Square in, in Yemen, and maybe just a little bit about the retablos to bring up our other theme, which is Latin America. Sure, I'll be very brief on Yemen because I will leave it to my colleague who, who's a very deep expert in, in Yemen and, and art. Um, when we first went to Yemen, it was the day before the, the peace discussion or agreement with the um, global um, agreement took place. And at the time, Change Square was still going on. And Change Square was a number of tents and banners of activists and those who were pushing for a change in the regime from um, allegations of corruption and totalitarianism. And so this was this nonviolent resistance. But like many things, unfortunately, things became violent. Some of the protesters have been killed. Um, they were, Yemen was pushed to the brink of a civil war, and now you know we're we're there. But this was a number of years ago when there was when they were still working for a positive change. And it was we're walking through Change Square where it had become where people were talking, you know, chewing cot, which was a very you know, communal type of activity for people to debate issues. I came across the tent um, that was an art square. And there were a number of paintings there that people were able to express things that they had gone through and children were painting. So it was used on one hand as a way for therapy, but on the other hand, as you had mentioned, a way of showing um, spirit and wanting change. And so artists who may have worked in a solitary fashion were now coming to the to the um, change square as a way of communion and change. So it was transformations in different ways. And then the other example was when we were in Peru doing interviews for the book, we went to Ayacucho, and Ayacucho was in the highlands where many of the atrocities um, had been perpetrated because that was where the, the hotbed, that area of the Shining Path um, insurgency. So there, there was a lot of uh, deaths and killings there. And we went into the Memory Museum, we saw retablos. And this is, this is an original, original type retablo. Retablo literally means um, behind the altar or behind. And it's usually of a religious depiction. You'll see it in, in, if you go travel through Spain or Latin America, it's all very different in Mexico. And usually it's of a religious scene. You'll see them sometimes very large, life sometimes small, but oftentimes they're, they're little traveling altars in a way. So this is what you will often find in Peru, where they're, they're lively happiness, you know, happy scenes of a village. But what we saw in the, it was the amazing resilience and the power of the artists. They transformed these traditional retablos into depicting scenes of what was going on through the atrocities. So you would see, you know, very difficult scenes, very graphic scenes where they would have the clay figures suffering hangings or dismemberment or beatings or things that they had experienced. And these were shown as a way to ex show what they were experiencing. And it was just very powerful in that way. And the creativeness at the, the faces, and you felt like you were being transported and experiencing, much like a photograph that you think is, of course, you can be transported by human beings. But to be transformed by clay figures was really an amazing thing. Thank you so much for bringing these examples of the work that is really, really wonderful. And of course, there, um, I'm now going to turn to Leon and we'll see a, a little example of one of his films. But there are, as you've heard, the photographs outside. If you haven't had 
uh, a chance to see them, as well as a couple of paintings by Manuel. Um, and I want also to remind everyone that the Twitter hashtag for this event is um, hashtag picks for peace. That is P I C S for the word for F O R peace. Um, so please feel free to live tweet as long as it's good um, <laughs> and about the uh, about the event. Otherwise, we'll we'll know. <laughs> uh, no, no, we're very open here and and transparent. Uh, so, uh, so um, are we ready to show Leon's film? We're now going to turn to uh, my friend from long time, Leon Shahabian, <laughs> who has been doing wonderful work with Leolina Productions. And they are a fantastic example of leveraging local voices. They not only tell local stories, but they air them on NBC, the most widespread channel in the Middle East, you know, so as opposed to spending a gazillion dollars constructing a channel that not very many people will watch, they went to, you know, the place that people were already watching and produced material of such quality and interest that NBC has consistently shown their documentary. So it, it's uh, really extraordinary what they've done. Do you want to introduce a little bit what we're going to see first? Happy please. Uh, first off, Happy anniversary to the Institute of Peace. Uh, as the president of a small nonprofit, I'm jealous of your competing power. Uh, but also, it's not easy, folks, to keep a nonprofit going for 30 years. Interests shift in this town. There's always another more interesting entity that can be funded. So kudos to everyone in this room who wakes up every day and says, how am I going to help peace today? Um, all right. I can't say anything more about what I do that Ambassador Schneider has not said. You're only as good as the last thing you've done. Um, the last thing we've done was received so well that I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to talk to you about the next show that we're hoping to make. And uh, Bismarck, bless his heart, said a few decades ago, a lot of decades ago, that uh, no person should ever see sausage and legislation being made because it will turn you off from both. Now that I butchered uh, the quote attributed to him, I would add that no person should see TV shows being made because you would never want to watch television again. So having said that, we're going to show you exactly how difficult it is to come up with an idea and make it into a reality. This is a four minute and change um, trailer. Think of it as a proof of concept. We're only gonna show you the first two minutes, which is the problem state, just to say everything is terrible. And that's why we need to make this film. We're not gonna show you the denouement uh, because we don't have that kind of time and it's more interesting to get you to chime in and uh, for us to hear from other folks. So we're going to show you how bad things were, and then we're going to stop it there. And uh, take it over. The first time I was in the war, I was 11 years old. What I felt the first time I was in the war, I was very angry. I was in the war, and I was in the war. I was in the war, and I was in the war. I was in the war, and I was in the war. سوات الدبابة كانت يعني متاحة أكثر بهذيك الوقت. بالحرب كان عمري 14 سنة. خلص أنت بتلتغي هون وبتبطل عمرك 14 بصير عمرك 50 سنة يمكن لأنه عندك مسؤولية كبيرة بظهري. هل هالشباب اللي ماتت، هالعيال، هالأطفال، مثل ما بيقولوا تدمي القلب. I see a taxi service stopping in the middle of the street. He unloaded the people going to work. I did not understand what was happening. Could I shoot or not? Our group had signed a ceasefire, but they failed to inform us. It shows, I think, how easy it is to kill uh, innocents. الشاب اللي كان معي اسمه ابراهيم 
كل هذا الجنب راح this question because it is related with what I'm hiding. We can start it well, there. Well, <laughs> uh, what did you see? All right, it's the 30th anniversary of USIP's founding. It's also the 40th anniversary of the start of the Lebanese Civil War and the 25th anniversary of the end of the Civil War. So these folks who are now middle-aged were teenagers once. Uh, and uh, they are seeing a lot of teenagers in Lebanon who are interested in spreading the Syrian war into Lebanon. And all they want to do is stop the next civil war. And that's the movie. Should we find enough funding uh, to pull it off? So just to, just to cap, encapsulate that, if I understand you correctly, Leon, the, the goal of the film is to get leverage these voices of these people who have experienced the tragedy of war firsthand and to be able to share that with young people who haven't and are attracted to what they're hearing about the current war and perhaps interested in joining and, and making and even bringing it to Lebanon. Uh, absolutely. Uh, General Schwarzkopf, uh, the night before the war started, showed his uh, officers and his HQ, the folks that would be there every day with him, a documentary on the Civil War. This is 1991. Ken Burns had just finished it. And he said, gentlemen, this is what we are about to embark on. <laughs> so it's the same concept with one difference. Um, most civil wars have truth, reconciliation, have a Desmond Tutu, or we hope they do. In the case of Lebanon, they skipped those and went to reconstruction. And, you know, we're at USIP, so to talk in policy terms, you're talking about a post-conflict country that's extremely pre-conflict right now. Yeah. And the folks that are in the film, All right, so the folks that are in the film wake up every day and try to make peace with themselves so they can look themselves in the mirror. Now, they don't have the training of the quality that USIP provides to help people deal with these issues and talk to these issues the way training uh, of experts, uh, you know, they don't have the toolkit. So these folks wake up. And they work with nonprofits that have nothing to do with peace and conflict resolution. You know, they feed the hungry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what we want to do is say thank you for everything you're doing so that you can make peace with yourself. But you have something that the youngsters don't have. We need to get you to their schools, to their clubs, so you can talk to them in a way no one else can. I lost my future my loved ones, educational opportunities. Don't listen to politicians. Don't listen to your teachers. Listen to me. I used to be just like you, not too long ago. Uh, let me just follow up with one other question, because you have a, a, a photograph in the display of another film, and there, there are many. We can talk about your cartoon series, Ben and Izzy, uh, which was a huge hit in the Middle East. Your, documentary about uh, the people who suffered from terrorist tragedies, including September 11th, and getting them to talk to each other, which was tremendously helpful in getting them to, to open up. But I want to focus on this film that's featured in the uh, photograph, Yemenets. I wonder if you could talk a little, Yemenets? Yemenets. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. All right, I'll keep it short because this guy has a story, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> so, Yemen, it's in the news. But guess what? Life goes on even in the middle of a war. Yeah, it may be short and brutish and, you know, 
can, can read Hobbes, etc. But you still have to wake up every day, go to school, suffer through electricity cuts, and it's a bunch of teenage girls who said, we can't study when the power is out. So let's come up with a way to harness um, the sun, and they're very close to the equator, to have a good supply of electricity when the power is out. Now that there's a war, they've cornered the market. They are not only allowed to study at night because they are harnessing the power of the sun, but, uh, you know, they're, they have their fridges going when everyone else, including hospitals, are out of power, and they're 15, 16, 17-year-olds. All we did was take a camera and film them doing the amazing thing that they do. And our broadcaster, NBC, as was previously mentioned, uh, they have an interesting tagline. They say, we see hope everywhere. So we wanted to go to the poorest Arab country, the one that is dealing both with, uh, you know, the strongest chapter of Al-Qaeda and the Houthis and a shooting civil war and foreign invasion, or it's not the right word. I don't know what the right word is. I'm just a filmmaker. But what can you do as a human being when there is no government to depend on? when there are no job opportunities after you graduate, you're going to have to watch this film to find out. <laughs> Very good. I think you're going to have a lot of people looking for that film right away. And I just, I just would add that that's such an inspiring story about Yemen, and that's not the only place that that's taking place. There's a wonderful documentary by Jahan Nujam, who did The Square, about the Egyptian Revolution called Solar Mama is again about another extraordinary woman who brought solar power to her village and this idea has has really caught on because it's also a theme in the current television series uh, Tyrant which I encourage all of you to watch if you want to see a television portrayal of ISIS and what's going on in the Middle East now it's, as a as a fiction drama it's quite well done um, so this is this is something that's going on in a lot of places, and it's very inspiring and fantastic that you've made a film about it. So now we're going to turn from the Arab world um, and the Middle East to Latin America, and it is wonderful to have a real live artist among <laughs> us, and not those of us who can't do teach uh, category. <laughs> And um, so uh, it's nothing better than someone who's not an artist talking about artists. So I, I'm very glad to have Thank you me. with us, Emmanuel. Thanks. Uh, and I'm so glad that you Thank brought you props much. also. Thanks. Uh, and so I would love for you to talk about your work and maybe with an orientation towards the subject that you and I talked about today, the uh, relationship between art and identity in your context in Guatemala. Perfect. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, first of all, I, well, I have to say that it's su such an honor to be working uh, at an institute that is celebrating its 30th anniversary as me the entire year. <laughs> so I'm doing it. So yes, it was beyond my, my expectation. So uh, yes, yeah, so I am from uh, Guatemala. Uh, I moved to the uh, United States uh, four years ago. I have been lucky enough to find the opportunity to work with uh, such a fantastic group of experts in different topics in peace building. Um, so, having said that, well, what I what I'm uh, what I'm bringing here to you um, is my struggle on identity. Um, when I communicate to you, saying I am from Guatemala, I moved to the U.S., all all those all those tags are bringing uh, very different meanings for, for 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 the context that you are. So, as um, my colleagues were saying. Like, uh, what do you do when you are, when you become, when you belong to a government that doesn't exactly represent who you are? You know, life has to keep going. You, 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 have, you have to keep going on dealing with the reality that you have been given. So what is my reality? Uh, I'm not going to take my, my, my conversation that far to the, to the time when the, when, the, when the two worlds connected, but that is one of the topics that I do challenge myself, you know, from 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 day to day, because um, before being Guatemalan, I am um, Maya Kiche, one of the uh, groups uh, of, of the Native Ameri uh, Natives uh, Americans uh, of this continent. So 
Um, that that uh, civilization doesn't exist anymore, according to uh, some studies. But I just happened to realize that uh, when I was in college and I was trying to identify myself, like moving from a small town to to the to the city, I had to 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 face the issues that. I was not exactly part of the in, of the Guatemala identity group because being Guatemalan is something that most of the people uh, from the from the city can relate to, but not exactly people who are from the from the countryside like me. So when I when I uh, migrated from 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 a, from a home from the, from a small town to to the city, I I, I realized that instead of instead of going outside. To look for answers, I had, I had to look back to the to the heart of my community. So that's when I decided to start uh, using my art to uh, communicate that I do have an identity. I do have something to say that is not exactly the the same way of thinking that the Western world has. Uh, the Western world has imposed in the community that I'm from a way of thinking, and. It just happened that not all of us are exactly uh, ready for that change. We are still uh, holding some of our, of our traditions. Um, what I'm wearing here today is a piece of the traditional uh, custom of, of, of my hometown. So this is a, a, a ceremonial headdress, which um, uh, uh, the, the main uses in, in Chichi Castanango, where I am from. So this is a little bit of the issue that I'm bringing here to you, and that's uh, why you see some of the art that is uh, Maya in the, uh, in the, 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 the exhibit. Uh, and that's just one part of who I am and in, my, in my background. The other side is that uh, I have been lucky to have the opportunity to work with the United States Institute of Peace Global Campus. Uh, uh, online learning platform that provides um, education and training in different in, in different topics in conflict management and peace building. Um, I have found this project very very interesting because I want to provide I, I want to be part of this of, of, of this project that uh, gives access uh, that, that creates accessibility for people around the world. Maybe some of my some of my friends. Maybe my parents, or you know, some some people that doesn't that, that don't have the opportunity to to, to, to travel to to or, or even to go to, to college in, in our own countries may may find some opportunities to get this kind of um, knowledge online. So this is um, a little bit of my of my roles of what I do of of, of who I am, and um, yes, so. I, guess so. I wonder if I could follow up just with a quick question, Manuel, about the art that you have uh, exhibited outside. It, you explained to me that it has mo Mayan motifs, but it's in a very modern medium. So could you tell me how that those two come together and, and who's your audience mm -hmm. and how it is received? Yes, so my audience in, in, in both, um, well, for the, for, for the Maya art, are the, the the new generations the the young people? I want to to be that bridge that I wasn't able to 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 to, to, to have when 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 I, when I was growing up. When I was growing up, I, I was told you know uh, you know we are a, a we are Guatemalans. You know the it basically it started to to teach us uh, Guatemalan history from the from from the uh, uh, colonization and after that. Before that is as if nothing had existed. So I want to be that bridge for the for, for the young generations. And what I'm creating is uh, using uh, stencil on canvas, uh, spray paintings because those are um, mediums of art that are popular uh, for the for for the young generations. That's a very beautiful way of putting it to be the bridge that you didn't have when you were growing up. Thank you. Um, I would now love to turn the discussion over to you, and we're very happy to take uh, questions that address any of the subjects that we have raised here. Uh, or you, you may have questions on other subjects. I have a feeling that our group here can probably 
answer uh, topics on, on many topics, or you may want to address issues that you see in the country that you're from, where art is working or is not working or could be used uh, in ways that perhaps people haven't thought of yet. So we welcome uh, comments as well as questions. Are we using uh, microphones or what are we using? Oh, we're going up here. Okay. Would you like to speak? And please uh, introduce yourself briefly first. Sure. Uh, my name is Todd Wiggins. I'm a videographer, obviously, <laughs> and um, I, I've spent a lot of time at art galleries, and so it's always great to meet a creative person. And I wanted to ask any of you, I think all of you, all of you have a product, including Cynthia. you as well, Cynthia, you have a product that can be sold, if you will. And um, so do you ever think about the commercial, the pure commercialism of your product versus the altruistic or the societal you know, aspect of it. Do you think about profit at all? <laughs> well, I'll answer last. You go, go ahead, other people. Uh, I think mine is very simple because this book was all the royalties go to the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, so it made it easier. There was a freedom You might think there. about it, but you don't get it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think about it. But actually, to be honest, that was very liberating because then I knew that I could carry the voices and be the bridge. You know, mm -hmm. as you talk about, for people who may not be able to have their voices heard because of where they're living or where they come from. So they, most people who were interviewed wanted to be heard. And they wanted maybe to help other people who have been in conflict situations. And that, that was very, very, something very meaningful to me. And I, I think if it had a commercial purpose, I think that would have been in the back of my mind the whole mm -hmm. time worrying about that. And I'm afraid that would have, I, I don't know, might have ruined the spirit, so to speak. So I was very grateful to SIP for, for that and the publisher, um, which was an independent publisher, a small independent publisher who allowed us to use um, photographs. Because when other publishers were saying, well, we can't, it costs too much, and we'd have to sell it for this, this small independent publisher, Roaring Forties Press, said, we'll publish it, and we'll, we'll publish all of the photographs of the people. Because I felt like it was the photographs of the people that were critical to their mm -hmm. stories. You are allowed to do things for profit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, as an artist, uh, you get that question quite a lot. Um, I think that it is a, a fair question that I myself would ask some uh, my, uh, a fellow artist if I met. Uh, because I think that my, 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 my answer for that would be that that is not my main goal while I, while I create art. If I have to charge uh, amount of money in case I create a, a, a non-profit organization, I think that that is fair because I want to be auto-sustainable because I have other goals that I want to achieve. My art is created with educational purposes and I think that uh, if I'm going to spend my 70% of my time creating art with, the biggest, with, with, with a bigger goal, I think that, well, you know, how, how am I going to eat if I don't charge for what I do? Do you have a, some thoughts on this, Leanne? I do. I'll try to be brief. <laughs> Look, there's nothing wrong with a nonprofit making a profit as long as you reinvest it in your next show. My problem is that the market is not yet ready. We make shows in the Arab world about Arabs. Now, the advertising revenue in that part of the world is so minuscule that it's considered a throwaway market by Hollywood. I will give you the 30-second answer to this. If I have a show, let's say I'm MGM, and you are an Arab broadcaster, and you say, I want that show, my in-house lawyers will charge more against their salary than your market allows you to pay for a full day. So that's the market we're in. The cost to reach each viewer in the Arab world is tiny. In fact, all of Arab advertising, typical human being, gets 1,500 pings a day of advertising. You know, Think of all the advertising you may see throughout the day. The cost to reach an Arab per year, that's 1,500 times 365, is 30 bucks. So, Broadcasters aren't making money. They're in it for something other than making a profit. 
content providers are not making money. Uh, you know, by way of example, uh, Israel, with a population of uh, less than 8 million, has a healthy, robust market the way that we have here, the way that China does, for example. And theirs, with a population of less than 8 million, is light years ahead of the total Arab uh, commercial space that is 22 countries and 330 million people. So we look forward uh, for this problem to be taken care of so that we don't have to send as many solicitations for folks going, I know you don't understand the language, and your grandchildren may watch this show, but trust me, this is good. Can we get a few dollars from you? So. Well, or you could discover oil or gas. Maybe that would also <laughs> solve your problems. <laughs> but um, I, I'd love to answer your question in a slightly different way um, with regards to the Timbuktu Renaissance Project, which, small plug here, I hope uh, some or all of you will stay and watch again with the sound on, on and also uh, Leon's film on these two screens after we finish. And what uh, the Timbuktu Renaissance Project is doing, it's a, a nonprofit association based in Mali run by myself and another American, Chris Shields, and two Malians, uh, Mani Ansar, who founded the famous Festival au Dessert music festival in Timbuktu, and Salif Niang, an uh, agricultural entrepreneur from Mali. What we are trying to do, working in close partnership with the Malian government, in particular the Minister of Culture there, is to promote uh, peace, unity, and economic development in Mali following the extremist occupation through a focus on culture. So we are very focused on actually the potential of culture to generate revenue. Uh, that is essential in fact, for that country to rebound. Um, and it is a place, Mali, you may or may not know that the Malian music is the root of blues and rock and roll. Many rock musicians have made a pilgrimage to this festival. It's known around the world. It has tremendous commercial value, both in terms of sales of music and also concert sales. The culture is what drew people to that country in tourism. That is still a little tricky in the north, but it's very safe in the southern part of the country. So we see culture as an absolutely essential element in regenerating the economy there, which is ultimately the only way that they will keep extremism at bay and thrive. So the connection between culture and revenue is uh, very direct and uh, very important in Mali. I'm not making money off it, but our project will be a success if the Malians are. Uh, yes, uh, Anna, do, do you want to stand? Well, I, I don't have to see you. <laughs> Everyone else can see you. Uh, hi, I'm Hannah with the Institute of Peace, but I actually have a question from Sarah, who's joining us online and oh. um, viewing from Canada. Uh, Colette and Leon, you both spoke about the restorative work of art in a post-conflict society. And Sarah's question is, what are some ways that art can be used within peace processes, such as truth and reconciliation commissions? Well, look, there are so many ways to use it. Uh, I'm only going to speak about my work. For the film that we saw two minutes of, of the trailer of the film, what I want to do is come up with photo boots, not the app on your phones, but real photo boots, and skin them in a way that it's a safe space and put them out throughout Lebanon. You go in, you close the curtain, you watch a few minutes from the film, and it says, would you like to share your experience from the war? Huge yes, tiny no. <laughs> or, if you're not sure, it may play 45 seconds from someone saying, during the war I was a victim, so-and-so uh, -so from my family is still missing, is a disappeared person. If you have any ways, if you know anything, here's how you can reach me. Or, during the war I was a perpetrator, I did the following, I feel terrible about it, uh, and, you know, I want to... I'm human, forgive me, you know. Uh, and then you can say, yes, I want to share. You can say, I wasn't born during the war, here's what I heard. And what we want to do is once a week, go to all of these photo booths, collect the footage, edit it, 
put some of it on social media and get mm. an actual truth and mm. reconciliation. Some of the folks that are in the yeah, film, um, it's interesting. One guy every year says, I have the locations of some graves mm. that are mass graves. Mm. I want to share that information, but I don't want to be the only one. Mm. So those from the other sides are welcome to sit down and let's disclose all of the locations so that people can have closure. So that's just one specific example. I'm not as creative as others on the panel, but... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'd like to just give a couple examples. That is creative. And I'll say two things. There are a few traditional methods, but I think the world is wide open, so to speak, to figure out new ways. And I think we, we keep going back to the same old ways of doing it. And one traditional way, and these are, these are valid, but I mean, I think it really needs a new area of how, to reconsider how we move past, how we use art, how we heal, how we move forward. But some of the traditional ways are, for example, document documentaries that we mentioned. Mm -hmm. USIP produced one called Confronting the Truth. And it's been used as a tool all over. We brought it to Libya. It's in Arabic. It's in um, uh, Bosnian, all different languages. And it goes through three different truth commission experiences and listens to the people. So instead of experts standing up and saying, you need a truth commission, you need this, telling people what to do, it's a facilitated discussion. Manal Omar, my colleague, went when the revolution was still going on in Libya and met with civil society, youth groups, women's groups, showed the, the film and used a facilitated discussion. What does this mean for you? Because it's too many times people coming in and telling people what methods they need to use instead of trying to figure out what will work in that context. That's one traditional way, but creative by using it as facilitated discussion rather than a, um, a dictate. Another thing are memory museums. You see the Holocaust Museum in the United States. In Ayacucho, it was this memory museum where everything from clothes to um, the retablos that I mentioned, to paintings, to recreations, they brought in artists to create postcards, children who use postcards of their memories of the war. So there's that. that's another type of um, more traditional. And then a the third one I'll say are memorials. As I mentioned, the Martyrs a Museum in Libya, and I also there was one in Yemen that I was taken through of the photographs. And I think culturally it was very difficult for some of us because you know, you're seeing these very graphic photos, but culturally that was very important in Yemen, and it was important in Libya, and so we needed to honor that. It wasn't you know, the, pretty, the nice little pretty photos from their college graduations, but it was of the death. And so that was one way. But it's, it's these memorials or art. You'll see big sculptures that people can come around or um, ponds, reflection ponds. I know there's a lot of talk after 9-11 of will there, how will that monument be. And a friend of mine who had um, came up with the idea for the Vietnam Memorial, he's a lawyer like me, so some of us can be creative. All my family are artists. I'm the one who became a lawyer. They don't know what happened to me. Um, but he had the idea for the memorial for the um, Vietnam Memorial with the names. So anyway, there's lots of different ways. It just has to be very open to the community as a form of healing and not imposed externally. Manuel, did you have any comment on that? I guess that um, creative takes on uh, how to use art um, for the advance of peace building. I think that uh, I, I was having this uh, discussion with uh, Dominic, who leads the Global Campus uh, Initiative, and uh, we were talking about, so do you create art? Is it, it is that art what you create uh, with us, you know, with this platform, with this online learning platform? I was like, not exactly. I would call it intentional art, because I have an intention while I create these artistic tools, an infographic, uh, well, um, I don't do the, the uh, animations, but we have a team dedicated to create animations while some of the instructors give their, their lectures. And I think that that's, that's artistic. It is that art? Maybe, but I think that is intentional art because somebody has an intention while it while creates it. And I would just answer with one quick example from um, Mali of the concerts organized by my colleague Lenny Ansar, which was a Caravan for Peace concerts, which he's done for two years now in Mali. The challenge is the division between the north and the south, the Tuaregs in the north and um, the 
rest of the population in the um, in the south and the desire for the Tuaregs to be separate. And uh, he organizes these concerts that go across the country and combine have musicians from all over the country and combine. Uh, northern and southern musicians singing together on the same stage, or even musicians actually modeling unity. So a musician like Kyra Arby from Timbuktu would sing a song in the dialect from Segu in the south, and she would say, I am also from Segu. We are all from the same country. We are all together. So, you know, quite literally embodying a unified country. And music is the lifeblood of that country, so this reaches thousands and thousands of people. Um, I think we have time probably for one more question. If there, um, if there is one from the audience comes alive, that's okay. <laughs> uh, why don't we take, you know, why don't I take those two, those, I can take all three questions together and then we can answer them. I think it's the best way to do it. Thank you, uh, Robert Thomason. I'm an independent web publisher. Very fascinating comments. My question is about freedom of expression and the challenge to it in the zones where you, you work. Um, I'm just want, hoping that you can speak a little bit to your experience, if you've had it, of overcoming challenges uh, to freedom through uh, censorship, any intimidation, um, and or have you been able to carve out a very good space for yourself where that's not an issue? Okay. Let's just combine that. Perhaps so there was a question in the, in the last row and then also here. So one question, one issue of freedom of expression or censorship. Hi, my name's uh, Raj and I'm a graffiti artist in DC. Uh, very similar question. Have you all ever worked on an art project that um, maybe through compromise and um, your client had maybe turned into propaganda? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Um, um, and one other question here. Hi. Question? Yes. Um, my name is Lee. Um, my question is a little bit related to the previous question about using arts in peace building. And I was wondering if either of the panelists has worked before or considered using arts as bringing different cultures together. Um, for example, I was working with an organization in Israel last summer that used photography and sports to bring Israeli and Palestinian youth together. And I was wondering if uh, you would work on that more of an active way of bringing uh, different cultures together. Okay, so uh, three great questions. Thank you. And I will turn to the panel and let you can answer all or, or one as you like. We had one question on the issue of freedom of expression and censorship. Have you encountered that? And then uh, the idea of you are commissioned to do something and now, are you have one idea of what it's going to be, but then it evolves into propaganda, maybe not what you had in mind, and then are bringing uh, diverse or even people in conflict together. Colette, do you want to go first? Um, I wouldn't say so much sens active censorship, more that as an author, when we did the book, I had to be very mindful of um, being a peace builder. So even talking about the how I just describe the conflicts in the beginning. There's no such thing as pure neutrality, but how do I do it in a way that I'm not exacerbating or creating problems with the people I'm working in the country? Or oftentimes when we're peace builders in the country, you're pro this, pro that, because it's often divided, just like in the US. Are you Democrat or you Republican? And everyone wants to put you in camps. And so you're trying to, as I say, peace building is done from the middle. So how do you work with all groups? So it's not so much, it's more self-censorship but in a way of being careful of how do you get the story out honestly, but do it effectively so you're not marginalized that they think you're trying to do propaganda. Um, that's one part of it. And the other part is a lot of people we interviewed because of the sensitivity of what was going on, especially in Libya and a couple other countries, they couldn't have their idea, Iraq, because of what's going on there now. And some of the interviews were done just you know six months ago. They had to not have their name or identity. So it's a form of censorship because they feel they'll be killed. So, you know, I don't know if that's exactly your, your, <laughs> your question. Pretty but powerful it was that, censorship. Yeah. And, and just on graffiti, I can't really answer your question, but I love graffiti. And I was so blown away by the graffiti that we saw in Libya. And I actually thought about this before, a lot of the photos in Libya and Yemen. I was just so blown away by what I saw there. It was, and there was a graffiti artist there in Benghazi who was actually killed because he was so powerful in what he was doing oh. leading up to the revolution, um, because it was so powerful and calling for change, he was killed. 
So I had wanted to get a lot of photos and maybe in another ex exhibition I'd love to do it just on the graffiti that we saw in Yemen and Libya. And just to jump in on that, because Egypt's one of their most famous graffiti artists, uh, Ganzir, uh, what has, is now living in New York, our benefit Egypt's loss, uh, because the current CC government made it impossible for him to stay there. Interestingly, he survived the first SCAF government and the Morsi government. Um, he's the one who did the famous piece of graffiti of the army tank with the little person standing in front of it that kept being erased and he kept going back and putting it on again and going red. Um, but he's now uh, living in New York because it's not safe for him to live in Egypt anymore. So they fortunately haven't killed him. But. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so I guess I, I would like to touch uh, on these three topics, uh, talking a little bit about uh, a short film that I uh, made in 2010. This short film uh, touches on, on, on topics of uh, uh, religion and cultural imposition. So this, th these topics are, are, are strong. Uh, and uh, so what I had, what, uh, the, the challenges that I had as, as the writer and as the director were uh, on, on facing how to communicate to the people that I, that I was going to talk about this, that I was going to present this. So well, I, I remember that when we were, uh, um, we were going to shoot the, the um, scenes uh, inside the church, and talking about a, a you know, not very pleasant scene. Um, so uh, I was struggling with, you know, with just with so much tension with, uh, with the, because in context, in, in Guatemala, uh, you don't, you don't question uh, uh, religion or Catholicism, and if you do, you are mm. doing you know something that is wrong. So I remember shooting these like really really quick. I I did only one take of that of that scene because I was so nervous mm. that I knew that I could have been you know kicked out of the of, of the church or, or just you know having a even more difficult situation. Okay, that on, on that on the on the propaganda uh, part, I think that my 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 biggest fear. When I, when I create my art, it's not that it turns into a propaganda piece of art, but that it turns into a folklore, folklorism piece of mm -hmm. art. Yeah. That because I do I do have such a big amount of respect for what I create that somebody mm -hmm. is going to start using that as a piece to bring uh, tourism, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's my biggest fear. Um, the other Interesting, just to point yeah. out, you know, everything's different. I'm, I'm hoping that the Malian culture will bring tourism, and <laughs> you're hoping that you won't be used for that. So <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's interrelated, connected. Um, the last part was, uh, could you refresh my mind uh, there on? Yes, exactly. So this short film has an has an open ending, and the open ending, the the main goal is to have people start talking about this, this identity thing because in order for us to become a better society, in my understanding, we need to have these discussions, talk to each other. What do you think? Why do you don't think about it? And it is really hard because we just passed a 36 years civil war in Guatemala where, you know, uh, we, it, it was pretty strong. So censorship was not exactly done well it, it was done by you know by the main powers at the moment dur during the war but after that the society or parents didn't allow us to to, to speak about you know these strong 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 issues you compromise every single day every single day you compromise and when you watch your film all you see are the compromises um, if i do something that will make the donor happy I may not be happy with myself as a filmmaker. I, the person who's in the film may feel that I've changed the essence of what they said to fit into a diagram that the project officer or program officer, or whatever family foundations are calling it these days, would want the world to fit in. But if I'm staying too true to what the broadcaster wants, then I may never work again as a filmmaker. So you have to find a happy medium between what you would like to do, because life is too short to make propaganda, right? So you have Somebody something. Somebody tweet that. Yeah, no, look, <laughs> you have a story that you want to tell. So you're waking up every day and you're calling people and saying, 
guys, I really think you should invest in this next film. And then you have folks that will be in that film, be it local heroes or folks that you think will become a local hero. They're just too young to realize it, right? So you have their future in your hands. You're talking about countries where it's very easy um, you know, to get a phone call one day and uh, yeah. asylum uh, away from being in New York, right? So, um, yeah, there's compromises. No, propaganda, you know, others may do it uh, and uh, they may have less white hair than me and, you know, that's fine. Uh, there's a market for that. But you have to be able to also compromise when the person whose story you're bringing to the screen has a lot of things that they would not like to show. Uh, you know, faces speak. And this most amazing woman who works with small kids in Pakistan who are failed suicide bombers because their parents sold them. Her face is the whole story. She said, you can't use my face. So in the film, when we were editing it, we called her Ms. Casper. And that's the treatment that we gave her. So how credible is someone who is looking at the camera, but you can't see them? And they're speaking, you know, in an accented English. You know, as a filmmaker, you have to compromise. Otherwise, what? Is the film worth getting that woman killed? Yeah. So, yeah. Very, very, very well put. Um, I may just take the moderator's uh, privilege and end with a, a couple of examples. I was going to say of a region we haven't talked about, Southeast Asia. You've brought in Pakistan. I'll, I'll follow up with that and end on Afghanistan. Um, in terms of bringing people together, or bringing together, I'll reference the work of my friend Shahid Nadim, the uh, leading playwright in Pakistan with his Ajoka Theater. He does historical plays where he tries to bring to light and communicate and he, all his performances are free. So this is a very grassroots kind of theater which has a very strong tradition in Pakistan. Uh, and he tells the story of uh, famous Sufi figures in the history of the region. I can't really say the history of Pakistan. It's only 1947, but the history of the region that is Pakistan, such as Dara, uh, Dara Shiko, the son of Shah Jahan, and his play of Dara actually was just the first Southeast Asian play ever shown at the London National Theatre. But this is a shared history. This is the history of Pakistan, also the history of India, two countries whose governments would have them be at odds with each other, but where the people feel a great affinity for each other. So Shahid's plays of Dara or Bule Shah, about another Sufi mystic, are very popular in Pakistan. They're equally popular in India, and they really bring the two people together. He has also a very effective way of evading censorship. He does satirical plays, too. One of them is called Burqa Vaganza which makes, uh, it's a musical, musical comedy that makes fun of being covered in every sense, not just wearing uh, covering, but covering things uh, that you're doing as well. Uh, and in this play, everyone is wearing a burqa, men, women, everybody. Uh, and is very popular in Pakistan, but the authorities don't like it at all, so it was banned. He wasn't allowed to perform it anymore. Uh, and so instead what he did was to announce that there was going to be another one of his plays performed. The audience came in and the police were there watching once it looked like it was going to be the historical play. They left and then they pulled everything down and instantly did Burqa Vaganza. Uh, they only got away with that once, then they got onto it, but, but it worked then. Um, and then I'll end on a slightly more serious note uh, referencing the potential role of the United States. Um, in preventing censorship and enforcing freedom of expression using the example of Afghanistan where thanks to uh, a significant amount of funding from the United States and others uh, there is a flourishing independent media landscape. You all may not know this but there are more than 75 independent media channels in Afghanistan both radio and 
television and it's a very free environment you can really criticize the government you can do a lot in a way the religious authorities are the greatest threat so uh, some of the media stations find themselves being attacked and you know people being uh, kidnapped and things like that but it is a thriving media landscape and I think it is uh, something that the international powers can do other than boots on the ground. Something you can do through the pressure of your international aid is to pressure the government to keep that open climate uh, and not to clamp down because it is something that really empowers the citizenry and is a critical element to building a democracy. So that's, that's a place where I think the U.S. can have a role. I think we need to end there so you can have a chance to see the exhibition outside and you're welcome to come ask our panelists other questions. And also please fill out your surveys, which you have on your seats, I think, and let us know what you, are they on the seats? Oh, they're being passed out. Please uh, fill out the surveys. Let us know, uh, them know uh, what you think. Um, and thank you so much for coming. It's really an honor to be a part of the 30th anniversary of this great institution. And please watch the films again. Thank you. Thank you. Very amazing. No, uh, what?